Christian Motorcycle Station Association is all over the world. We have chapters all over. There's, I think there's two of them in York, isn't there? How many? 30-some. Yeah, 30 some in Pennsylvania. So we're not the only ones. <clears throat> and we try to capture as many as we can. <laughs> uh, we come from all different types of people, races, colors, creeds, whatever, but we all love Jesus. <clears throat> and we want people to know who Jesus Christ is. Um, yesterday, was a special day for myself. Uh, 48 years ago yesterday, I went to Teen Challenge. Um, all those Jesus freaks <laughs> really messing my head. And the third day I was there, I accepted Jesus Christ. And uh, so tomorrow will be 48 years knowing him. And to me, it's an honor to be able to, to be with, uh, with these people. I remember the first time I heard of them, and I said, there's no such thing as Christian bikers. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I were in a church, and they had a sign up that said, for March for Jesus or something like that, and it said, Tribe of David Christian Motorcycle Association. And we're walking out, and I said, Linda, there ain't no such thing as a Christian biker. Come on, I was out there. I know better, you know? And uh, she said, well, you should call them. So I called the number. Man, God speaks to the husband through the wife. <laughs> so I called him, and I got this Puerto Rican guy on the phone. <laughs> And within 45 minutes, he was in my parking lot of the apartment that we live in, lived in, and he came in with this Puerto Ricanized motorcycle, and I thought, my word, what did I get myself into? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, within five minutes, I fell in love with the guy. He became my closest brother. He's with the Lord now. He got run over by a tractor and trailer. That's not the way you do it, you know, to get to see heaven, but that's how he did it. And uh, <clears throat> we miss him a lot. He's the one that started the tribe of David. God put it in his heart to start a Christian motorcycle association here in, in Harrisburg. And Jesse has been an inspiration to all of us. Jesse Morales was his name. Uh, shortly after we got in, to the tribe of David, he looked at me and he said, you're going to be the chaplain from now on. I said, what? <laughs> no. But it happened, so <clears throat> here we are. So I want to share with you some things that I've really been praying about this because nothing makes me more nervous than standing in front of you people. Uh, because, you know, you're familiar with me and all that kind of stuff. And if I make a mistake, you can't tell me next week because next week we'll be in Marysville, right? We'll be in Marysville Church. So, uh, <laughs> so you can, you know, forget about it. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to do as God has instructed me throughout the week and a half of... Uh, praying and fasting, and I just want to lift up Jesus Christ. To me, preaching the Word is an act of worship. It's, it's not sitting down and trying to teach people stuff. It's an act of worship. And through my act of worship, if you can learn more about walking with Jesus and getting closer to Him, then praise God. He is so good to us. All the time. All the time. <laughs> Never quits. So he's just amazing. I, every day I'm amazed at it's the things that God does. And uh, as you know, fortunately, I get to see God work almost every day down at New Life for Girls. And uh, it's just a pleasure. I'd like to pray now and ask the Lord's uh, blessing on us. Father, I thank you for all that you've done, Lord. You've been so good to us and, and so kind and loving. And we just want to love you right back. And Father, I ask that you would just 
bless your word today and help me, Lord, to uh, share it the way you want it shared, to give you glory and praise and honor that we can walk out of here and say, oh, hallelujah, we've been with Jesus today. And I thank you for that. I thank you that you would stir our hearts up, that we open our hearts and receive your word with meekness and live for you. And people will look at us and see Jesus. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to start out with Genesis and hopefully end up in Revelations. I hope you packed a lunch. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I start there because God made Adam. He picked up a pile of dirt, formed it to look like a man, and then he breathed on it, and it became a living soul. And, and there's Adam, cool Adam who is in his future thinking going to invent motorcycles for us to ride. <laughs> but he makes Adam. And it's so wonderful. And Adam is so smart. And he names all these animals and stuff. And God says, wow, this is really cool. But there's something wrong. Where's there, Adam needs somebody. So what did he do? He put Adam asleep. And he made a woman. <sighs> Thank God. <laughs> he made her out of flesh, though. Think about that. Us guys were made out of dirt. <laughs> Our wives, soft and warm, are made out of flesh. And that, to me, says a whole lot, you know. So I like to treat my flesh good. <laughs> but it all started, then they, they, they made a mistake. They sinned, and we know about that. And then God gave us a promise. In Genesis 3.15, he said that he was going to raise up a Savior. I'm paraphrasing, okay? He's going to raise up a Savior, we know who he is. We can look back and remember that. Through the process of time, people started getting different ideas. And they started getting into worse and worse and worse and worse sin. I picked up a book. It's called The History of the Names of Schindler's List. This one Nazi had a Jewish woman, and he didn't like her nose. He told her she was ugly with that nose, and he took his gun out and shot her nose off. And I sat there, and I read that, and it just tore, how can man be so rotten? How can man be so rotten as to do something like that? And the Lord says, Rick, it's demon possession. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, they invited the devil to take over. And he's been doing a real good job. Look what he's doing over with the terrorists all over the world. People don't normally do stuff like hacking people's heads off. That's all demonic. The hatred is so bitter. And it got really, really, really bad till there was only eight people left on the whole earth that were righteous, we have Noah and his family. I saw a, a thing on television, a scientific thing, and they drew this, this uh, 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 they could check, your, check DNA record, not records, but somehow, I don't know how scientists do it. I'm not a scientist. But it went like this. It was a long line like that. And then all of a sudden, it went way down into real small and then came out and then went back up again. And what they said was this is the population. The population 
grew and grew and grew and got bigger. Then all of a sudden, for unknown reason, it dropped down to almost nothing. There was only like a half a dozen people, they said. And I'm sitting there, you dummy, pick up your Bible and read it. <laughs> you scientists think you know so much. Well, we had eight people, and then they came out and started us over again. And then, of course, the devil come along and did his little thing, and he's been doing it ever since. And it gets worse and worse. Then God raises up prophets, and they come and they prophesy to the Jewish people. You, you're in sin, you're idolatrous, you're doing all this kind of stuff, and then all of a sudden you don't hear from them anymore. We get 400 years of total silence. And then there's a, a new thing comes up called Pharisees and Sadducees, who they decide they're going to help God out. They're going to take the Ten Commandments. They're going to add a couple little extra rules there. You know, like you got to wash your hands five times before you eat. Tell a biker that. <laughs> <laughs> it just don't work. <laughs> but they were making rules like this. And, and it just got ridiculous. And pretty soon they had the idea that God was this mean guy up there waiting to slap people around. I thought like that, waiting to slap people around, do anything. They, he, he's just waiting for it. Come on, man. I'm just, let me use this new whip I got. You know, that kind of thing. That's the kind of God that they were representing. They made all these rules and stuff. We don't do that nowadays, do we? Oh, wait a minute. I forgot something. This one Bible school, uh, the dean asked me to find another school because he didn't like me praying in another language. Oh, and you know what else they did? They had this, if, if men had hair long enough to touch the collar, they were in sin. And the girls got up front, and they'd had to get down on their knees and measure from the bottom of their skirt to the floor. And it better be right, or you're a sinning, sinning harlot. Hmm, sounds a lot like what the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing. Funny thing is, when I met Jesus, he didn't care that I was selling drugs. He didn't care that I'd been in prison. He didn't care about none of that stuff. What he cared about was this broken guy on his knees asking him to forgive him. That's what he cared about. And my hair was long, and it was black and greasy, and I stunk. And I had, well, I don't want to tell you everything. <laughs> they took my motorcycle club colors and tried to burn them, and they wouldn't burn. They had to soak them in gasoline. That's how filthy I was when I came to Jesus. Now I take a shower every day, sometimes twice a day. <laughs> Isn't God good? <laughs> Anyhow, I'm thinking all these, these Pharisaic laws and all this kind of stuff. One of the things they taught us at Teen Challenge was live a life so that when people look at you, you see, they see Jesus. That you don't have to walk out there and grab somebody and throw them in a corner and say, you better get saved, man. <laughs> I only did something like that once. <laughs> a guy was giving me a hard time, a really hard time, saying nasty things. And I told him, I said, look, I only want you to do one thing tonight. He says, what's that? Real smart, like. I said, when you get home, I want you to pray. For what? I want you to pray that I'm saved, because if I wasn't, I'd be tearing you up right now. <laughs> so he got the point. He didn't bother me anymore. <laughs> but anyhow, 
they had all these, these different rules and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And Teen Challenge teach, teaches us that we learn to love people and we let people see Jesus Christ in us. And it's just like, yeah, that's going to work. And guess what? Through the years, I found out it does work. They taught us about getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. They taught about the Holy Spirit working through us. They told us, according to Luke chapter 21, that I don't have to worry about what I'm going to say because the Holy Spirit has given me a mouth, or God has given me a mouth, and the Holy Spirit will speak through that. I'm going to share an experience. A friend of mine who I'd been talking to about the baptism in the Holy Ghost didn't really want to know all of it. He wanted to know some of it. And then one day he called me up. He says, Rick, can you help me out? I said, yeah, what's up? He's a pastor, brethren in Christ, who is baptized in the Holy Ghost now. <laughs> Anyhow, he says, I got this guy in prison. I can't get through to him. I've been up there months going up to visit this guy, and I, he just it just doesn't sink in. Would you go along with me? I said, sure. So we went up, and I started sharing with him. Within 10 minutes, he was sitting there bawling and blubbering, saying, man, I need to get saved. I, I got to get saved. And so we led him to the Lord. On the way to home, on the way home, he looks at me and said, how did you do that? I said, I didn't do nothing, Ray. I didn't do a thing. Holy Spirit anoints the words that come out of my mouth. He's the one that does the convicting. He's the one that convinces a person they need a Savior. That's the Holy Spirit. I learned that. So those Sadducees had all their rules, and some of your Christian churches have all these rules. They look at you ought to see some of the girls that come in. <laughs> this one girl named Stevie, I tease her a lot because of that. There's a big tattoo across her neck, on her legs. She said, how do I get rid of that? I said, why? Jesus don't care. He's looking at your heart. And there ain't a time in chapel service that you don't see the tears coming down her eyes when her arms are up in the air and she's worshiping God. I'm going to tell you something, man. When God reaches out and touches somebody, He don't care what they look like. It don't mean nothing to Him. What matters is that they love Jesus so much, so powerfully, that their life begins to change and people see that change. I shared with you before how my mother and my two sisters came up to see me a month after I came to Teen Challenge, walked right up to me and said, my son's up here, his name's Rick Crone, can you tell me where to find him? And I looked at her and I said, Mom! And we all cried and hugged each other. She saw there was a change. There was a change. It's the Holy Spirit. I have a couple Holy Ghost messages I like to preach. One's called Holy Ghost Facelift. <laughs> Another one's called Holy Ghost Mouthwash. <laughs> and the other one's a Holy Ghost Lobotomy. <laughs> He changes us. He changes us. When I look and see what's going on in people's lives, um, we have a guy who's our president. His name's Ron. If you would have met Ron the first time he came to Tribe of David, you would have said, like I did, oh my word, where did this guy come from? <laughs> but has he ever mellowed out? Really, he has. <laughs> and I remember that so vividly when he came into us. And, and been watching him over the years. 
about two years ago, I said, man, Ron, I said, I am really impressed by, by you. And he said, what, what, what happened? What did I do? I said, man, I've been watching God change you over the years. That's what should be happening to us because of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to share, I want you to look at something here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, and I, I really like this, verse 16. Ain't that something? 3.16, John 3.16. You know how many verses I find in the Bible that are chapter 3, verse 16, that are really powerful ones? Wow, this is one of them. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of the angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now, if we look at that, and then we go to John chapter 17, you'll see something, something that I just, I think is amazing. I'm a little nervous, so that's why my hands are shaking. <laughs> okay. Jesus is praying to God the Father. Now, this is like you're stepping into Jesus' private prayer room. You're hearing Him talk to God, His Father. It's a private conversation, just like we have our private times of prayer. We don't want nobody to hear it. And this is what Jesus says. He's talking to God the Father. He says, I in them, him in me. And then he says, and thou in me. Man, the first time I read that, I said, wait a minute. I'm kind of dumb, you know, and I got to think things out. And I'm saying, wait a minute, Jesus in me and God in Jesus. That is so cool. God's living inside of me. 1 Peter chapter 4, or chapter 1, verse 4, I believe it says, that we have received, we are partakers of the divine nature. Now, follow me here. We are partakers of the divine nature. This is how our life changes, because we are partakers of the divine nature. The minute we get born again, God, Jesus, the Holy Ghost comes to live inside of me. That's why the Word says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But watch what Peter says. How many times have you seen your child act like your husband and said, yeah, just like your dad? Or your daughter acts just like your wife, and you say, yeah, you're just like your mother. <laughs> Come on, you ain't going to sit there and say you never heard that. <laughs> God is my Father. And Peter there, where I just told you, it says we are partakers of the divine nature. How do you spell divine nature? Divine starts with D. Nature starts with N-A. I have God's DNA. Look it up. That hit me one day. I was sitting out in the kitchen at nighttime reading that, and I said, whoa, God's DNA in me. That's why I'm changing. I'm becoming more like the Father. People need to see Jesus in me. And that's why I'm changing. I'm becoming more and more like God. So someday, when you pick up the news and you see a picture of me walking across the Susquehanna, you'll know I'm getting really close. <laughs> God.
God's DNA. Okay, let me ask you a question. This is so important. I never cared about Dover until Linda and I came down. I heard, started hearing rumors about my grandfather and how him and his brother went out to the stone church and got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I always thought I was the first Pentecostal nut in our family. I started getting an interest. And I remembered stopping in here one day and, and somebody handed me a thing that told me about it. And I went home and I said, Linda, this is amazing. And then we stopped in here and we liked it. And Linda said, I think we found our church. I started getting a burden for the people in Dover. But I don't live here. We're waiting for that time to come. But I'd like to be able to walk down the street and people say, hey man, where do you go to church at? Dover Assembly. Come on. Not because of me running my mouth, but because of me living my life. How do I do that? I spend time in the Word, time on the knees, and time allowing God's DNA to grow in me. Watch this. Philip said to Jesus, I always laugh at this. I do. I laugh. When I read the Bible, sometimes I put my own self in there, and, and, and I'm picturing, I say to Jesus, show us the Father. And, and he looks at me and says, what? I've been here all this time with you, and you don't see the Father? Look at me. You see the Father. Look at me. You see the Father. Look at me. You see Jesus. Look at me. When I was in Bible school this last time, I was down in Fort Myers, Florida. Met this guy from Africa. We're in America. At least some people say Florida is part of America. <laughs> A weird part, man. <laughs> so, Matthew and I are walking down the street, and Matthew reaches over and takes my hand. I said, wait a minute, hold it. Oh, wait, back off there. He wants to hold my hand while we're walking down the street. No, we don't do that in this country. There's a word for that. <laughs> you know? And Matthew, I said, why are you want to hold my hand? No. That was, that's how I was. He says, brother, brother, that proves we're good friends. All men do it over there. I said, what? Yeah, they walk around holding hands. It took me a while. But soon I was walking around holding Matthew's hand. We had a tr problem at New Life for Girls years ago, many years ago. Somebody burned a wooden cross. I think you're all familiar with that kind of stuff. When I hear about that, I think about the man that got down on his knees, put his arm around me, taught me how to pray and ask Jesus into my heart to change my life, to get me walking on this road that I have enjoyed. Because there's nothing... I still wonder why God loves me so much, but I wouldn't trade it for nothing. When that former Black Panther from Detroit, Michigan, prayed with me to receive Jesus Christ, Watch me as I be like Jesus. And I walk down the street with my friend Matthew 
that black man from Africa who's as dark as you can get. And we're holding hands. And I dare you to say I'm one of them. <laughs> no, I love my brother. Watch me. Watch me love my brother. Watch when I walk, when I talk. Watch how I do business. Watch how honest I am. Watch how if somebody gives me too much change, I say, here, you made a mistake. Watch that kind of thing. Don't you dare call that a blessing. That's the same as stealing. The Bible specifically in the Old Testament says if you find something, you're supposed to hold it until the owner finds out it's missing and then he comes looking for it, you're supposed to give it to him. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. So I need people to watch me. I need people to watch me put my arms around brothers in the Lord. I need that. I'm always going to need that. And the reason I need it is because I've been born again for a reason. Jesus didn't save me just so I could sit back in the pew and listen to my wonderful pastor who Linda and I thoroughly enjoy <laughs> preach the Word. No, He saved me to learn from my Sunday school teacher, from my pastor, how to walk that road so that when I do walk out there and somebody comes up to me and says, hey man, show me the Father. And I can say, <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> I'm going to show you the Father. Because they're not going to come and ask me to show them the Father unless they know I know the Father. Uh-huh. They have to know that I know the Father before they're going to come and ask me. How's that for you guys that are supporting Teen Challenge? <laughs> Anyhow, that's what God put in my heart to share. Slowly, something is growing inside of me about this town. I believe that God wants to take this church and turn this town upside down. I believe that. But the only way he's going to be able to do it is we need people to come up to us and say, wow, show us the Father. And then we can say, come on, let's go to church together. I'll buy you breakfast. I'll take you out to lunch after church. And we just be loving on all our neighbors doing the things that we know we can do, forgiving each other. <laughs> Easiest things in the world, just forgive and forget. Just loving on each other, big love feast going on that Jesus instigated. The moment you got saved, he started a love feast in your heart. David Wilkerson tells a story. Of course, you know he's my hero. <laughs> David Wilkerson tells a story, and I love this story. There was two girls that came knocking on his office up in Clinton Avenue. Fortunately, I, I had a real blessing. David's mother was uh, a mentor to me. I loved that woman. She was awesome. No wonder David and Dawn <laughs> loved Jesus so much. But Dave tells this story. These two girls came and knocked on his door. And he told them to come in. He, they went in the office and they were crying. He said, what's the matter? Oh, Brother Dave, we lost our first love. 
They're crying because they lost their first love for Jesus. He says, well, here's what I want you to do. Go across the hall, get a couple of buckets. And they're looking at him real funny. Grab some mops, some rags, get some soap. Right across from Clinton Avenue, I lived there. I, they sent me up to Teen Challenge in New York when I graduated to learn how to operate a center. Anyhow, right across the street was this apartment house of all old people. He told the girls, get your buckets, go across the street, start knocking on doors. And when they answer the door, ask them if there's anything you can do for them. You'll mop their floor, you'll wash their dishes, you'll make their bed, you'll do their laundry, whatever, whatever they need for you to do. So that's what they did. They went in, knocked on this lady's door. She's looking at these two girls. What do you want? Well, ma'am, you know, we just want to do some really cool things. We we're kind of thinking maybe you need some help, clean your apartment or something like that. Well, you know what? I could use some help. And they went in and did it. Well, they were so thrilled, they went and knocked on another door. And this went on all day long. And Dave got to wondering, where's those girls at? And finally, it was getting dark, and they came back. He said, where have you been all day? He, they said, man, we've been cleaning all the apartments over there for all them old people and stuff. It is so great, Dave. We, just, we didn't lose our first love. We just needed somebody to sick it on. <laughs> Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus, number one, to go about doing good. You hear people say those Christians are a bunch of goody two-shoes, and then those Christians shy away. Well, we're not going to go by works. We're going by faith. Well, let me see your faith by your works, says James. How God anointed Jesus first to go about doing good, then healing diseases and setting the demoniacs free. In that order. So as we go about doing good and giving glory to God, and people look at us and say, hey, you want to see a Jesus person? A real one? Go up there. Go up to the end of town to that, that Assembly of God church up there. The place is full of them. They're crazy. They run around helping people out all the time. Love will flow because we'll just humble ourselves and let it fly out of there. And like I did, I got to the point where it didn't bother me at all to walk down the hall holding Matthew's hand. And every time, every year, we have conference in Sayreville, New Jersey. That's where my credentials come from. Uh, Covenant Ministries International. And sometimes Matthew's there waiting for me. And we walk into the sanctuary, holding hands, hug each other. Why? Because we love each other. Why? Because Jesus lives in us. He changes our lives. He makes us a bunch of Jesus freaks. People call me a Jesus freak. I tell them, I'm not the freak, man. God made me to worship. You're the freak. You're not worshiping him. <laughs> so, that's it. This is what God gave me to share with you. When Philip went to Jesus and said, show me the Father, think about that. Jesus showed us the Father, not the guy with the big board waiting to hit you like the Pharisees and Sadducees were. The Father. Think about this. Man, think about this. It's against the law for a Jewish person to have anything to do with pigs. 
And if your son should run away and spend all his money and your money, you're not supposed to have him come back in the house. In fact, you can even kill him. That's, that was the rules. Read Old Testament rules. Read them in there. If your son's rebellious, you have the right to kill him. I'm telling my grandson that. You better get right, man. He's, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> Here comes a father who loves his son every day. He's looking down that hill, looking for his son. And one day, he sees him. Skinny, dirty, filthy, dope fiend. Probably got tattoos, got long hair looking like a hippie. Nasty looking thing. He'd been out there in the world partying, doing everything the world does. And dad's standing. I know what I. Dad's watching him. And dad has a heart of compassion. And how many times you read in the Word of God where Jesus had compassion? And dad had compassion on his son. And dad can't take it no more. And he runs down that hill, grabs his son, and hugs him, kisses him. Why? Because he loves his son. It doesn't matter that he's filthy with pig dirt. It doesn't matter that he smells like a stinking old pig. Boy, I'm glad Bill's not here. <laughs> I, I love that guy to pieces, but I don't want to offend him now. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, he just loves this guy and holds him and hugs him and takes him up to the house. And the first thing he does, give him a ring, give him the credit card, everything. You're my son. I love you. I learned that and it helped me because I had two sons and one was a dope fiend. He died. He called me one night and he said, Dad, he said, I'm so sorry. I know you're ashamed of me. And I told him, I said, Todd, I'm not ashamed of you. You're my son. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud to have you for my son. And I picture that with that father looking at his son coming up there and he runs down and he hugs him and he's crying. I love you. That's the father that I want people to see in me. That's it. I want the world to look at me and see Jesus. I'm going to pray, and then, Pastor, you can take over. Okay. Father, I thank you for the fact that you do love us so much. Oh, God, you're just so good to us. I thank you for that. I ask that you would help us, Lord, to live this life out that people will see it, and they'll say, man, what a... What a cool God those people worship. And they'll want to worship you too, Father. And I ask that you would just anoint every single person in this room right now with that holy unction and that glowing look on their face that says, I love Jesus. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Bible says, uh, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. <laughs> it's you, buddy. <laughs> but you know what? Everybody sitting here has been forgiven much. 
we should all have that same love that our brother has for Jesus. Amen. And what better way to show that than to let people know who your dad is. Mm -hmm. And not by talking to them, by letting them see how you live. Are we different than them? Or do we act the same way they do? We should be totally different from the people we hang around with. So they see something different in us. They've already got what they've got. They want something different. And we need to be the ones to show them. Amen? I'm going to have the ushers come forward if they were. We're going to receive an offering for our brothers and sisters here to help their ministry, to bless them, to allow them to reach out into places that we can never go. Can I say something? No. No, good. <laughs> um, we do a thing. CMA does not ask for money. Once a year, we do a thing called Run for the Sun. And one day out of that year is when we raise money. So we go around all year bugging everybody we can see. And I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but that one day, we do what's called a Run for the Sun where we, we ride our bikes and we get sponsors. Last year, we got, what, four and a half million dollars? That four and a half million in one day. All that it money... It won't be that much today. <laughs> <laughs> all that money goes to the Jesus movie that it spread all over the world. It goes to buying motorcycles, trail bikes for missionaries in yeah. South America. Missionary, missionary ventures. And, and what else? Open doors. Open doors and, and the God smuggler thing, smuggling Bibles. Okay. It all goes to that. We don't keep it. Nobody gets paid. It all goes in that. So I just want you to think about that. Because maybe next year I might ask you for some money. <laughs> or can we ride with you? Yes. If any of you want to join, hey, it's as easy as joining church. Now, I have a little <laughs> Suzuki. Can I still join? Absolutely. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah, we're non-denominational. And it only goes about 40 miles an hour, though. <laughs> Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much. God, you use each one of us in the areas you place us. You do great things through each one of us as we answer your call. We thank you for how you're using Rick and the CMA team to, to reach this world with the love and the power of Jesus Christ. We pray that you bless these, these gifts that we're about to use to further your kingdom. And we will thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pray, buddy. Come on down front. I'm going to ask the CMA team to come up. We're going to pray for you guys as you continue to do your ministry. And I'm going to ask the church to come up and lay hands on them and surround them and pray God's blessing upon them. They do good work. Amen. Reach people that we will probably never see. Well, we at least hope we don't see the people that Rick sees because <laughs> he preaches in jails. So, oh, yeah, you all do. Yeah, we all do. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Do you lead worship there, too? Yep. Yes. Awesome. What we did here today is yeah. what we do in there. That's what we do. Our chapter does that, not every chapter. I don't ride a bike. So. <laughs> well, every once in a while, Rick will come in and say, Well, we're going to jail next week. <laughs> And I asked him to clarify that for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're thankful you're part of our church, buddy. Well, glad to be here. <laughs> Father, we again thank you. We thank you for sending Rick and his lovely wife to our church. We thank you for her because we know what Rick is like. <laughs> we thank you for being the stabilizing factor in that family. And Father, we thank you for the ministry that he and his, his entire chapter do. We're so thankful that, God, you've raised up people in every corner of the world to promote and, and share your gospel. And Lord, as we heard this morning, we are part of that. We are in our town. We're in Dover, 
That's our mission field. That's our Jerusalem. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. Help us to be encouraged as we see the, the CMA team do what they're doing in all parts of the world to share the love of Christ. We pray your blessings upon them. Anoint them. Use them. Open doors for them, Father. Allow them to be used mightily for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we ask the same for us as well, for this church to be used mightily, to open doors, to reach people, so that people can say, I met Jesus because of someone who attends Dover Assembly. Or I met Jesus because of Rick and the, and the CMA team. I'm in heaven now because someone loved me into the kingdom. Father, we are thankful that you loved us into the kingdom. All of us were unlovely. All of us were forgiven much. And for that, we are eternally grateful. We're thankful that you chose us, that you loved us unconditionally. Father, we just commit ourselves to you. We pray that we want to be used to show our appreciation, our gratitude, and our love for you, we want to be used by you for your glory so that you get the credit, you get the glory. Then when people see us, they really see Jesus. And when that happens, we know that's only possible because of Jesus living in us. So, Father, we commit ourselves, our entire church to you, the, the CMA team to you. Use us, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We love you guys. We appreciate you.